Hello, Sunday School teachers. This week we get a nice jailbreak story. Peter gets busted out of prison. Who doesn't love a good jailbreak? Now, there was a TV series, I think it was on the Fox Network, a few years back, Prison Break. Um, little known fact, Bonnie Wilkham from our congregation has a, I believe it was a son-in-law, I think it was a guy who was married to her daughter who worked on getting props for TV shows, and he was on the show Prison Break. And at one point, they needed a picture as a prop, and he got a picture of Bonnie's other daughter. And that was on TV and the Fox Network. I think I have the details mostly right with that story. But um, the, <laughs> the overall point is people are intrigued by the story of prison breaks. And you now there's all kinds of movies and and uh, and stories built around the, the premise of uh, prisoners finding their way out of jail. And here we have in Acts chapter 12, your Sunday school story for the week is the Bible's great prison break story. The idea of unfairly incarcerated people actually is all through the Bible. You might remember Joseph way back, and we've been talking about him in church lately, uh, way back in the book of Genesis, uh, we have a guy unfairly imprisoned, and and he does bust out. Well, he doesn't bust out. Uh, God gets him out through uh, some back channels, but um, there are other people in the Bible who do not experience this, most famously John the Baptist, who is sitting in jail and actually at one point sends his disciples to Jesus as, well, what's up? Why am I still here? Are you going to start to do the things we've been waiting you to do to like set innocent people free and punish guilty people? But uh, yeah, John the Baptist died um, after his incarceration. Um, you know, the, the news hits heavy uh, in the last couple of weeks in catechism class Wednesday. We talked about the Russian dissident Alexei Navalny, who... Uh, really amazing scene today that thousands of people showed up for his funeral. Most people all probably know in a list and will be closely monitored by the government in Russia. But uh, Navalny actually was a Christian. Uh, had had some amazing things to say about how the Beatitudes drove him to the decisions he made, which ultimately ended up with him being incarcerated and killed in prison. So these stories don't all have happy endings. And then coming up... I believe in one or two weeks uh, you will have the story of Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi, and they have an opportunity to bust out of prison, but they don't. <laughs> and that leads, we'll, we'll save that story for a few weeks. So what's what's the point here? If someone is innocent and thrown in jail, will they be set free? And the answer is unequivocally 100% yes. Although with the qualification that we don't know if that freedom will come in this world or the next. But the innocent always will be vindicated, one way or another. And here we see Peter. Now again, it's not like the days uh, here with the apostles, that all the apostles are always escaping persecution. At the beginning of the chapter, we read about how James... One of the really like uh, inner circle disciples, the brother of John, the son of thunder, uh, he was killed very early on in, in all things considered by by King Herod. Now, there's a few King Herods. Uh, this this would be uh, the third King Herod that we've encountered in the Bible, uh, and uh, and really a a bad guy. And he he uh, well he'll get his comeuppance, but he does. Uh, murder James, the brother of John. And uh, now the disciples, now there's uh, 11 apostles again. Uh, Judas had had died, took, took his own life, and then he was replaced by Matthias, so we're back up to 12, but now we're down to 11. And the disciples are thinking they're going to be at 10 because Peter's in prison. Herod is going to make it real public. The only reason Peter's still alive in prison is because Herod wants to get maximum attention for this. He sees that he's gaining a lot of public popularity when he's killing the followers of Jesus. Peter's the big fish here. He's the guy who's been the most public. From Acts chapter 2, he's been front and center. He's been preaching publicly. He's been doing miracles publicly. Now he's in prison until he's not. Uh, maximum security setup here. 
<laughs> you talk about they were not leaving anything to chance with the guarding that they had of Peter. You know what this story really bears some echoes of is the story of the, well, we might call it Easter. <laughs> so the Roman authorities had pulled out all the stops. They were aware of the rumors that Jesus had actually started to spread, that he wouldn't uh, stay dead. Jesus told people, like, I am going to die, but I'm going to come back. And this was a known fact. And so the, the Romans weren't really afraid, and the Jews, for that matter, the Jewish leadership, the Sanhedrin, they weren't really afraid of Jesus coming back to life. They didn't actually think that would happen. But what they were afraid of is the disciples stealing the body. So they set up this maximum security situation with this seal, with this rock, and um, well, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and the rock was rolled away and the seal was broken actually uh, ended up their security measures were rather counterproductive because they helped to uh, to actually prove the resurrection and that it wasn't a grave robbery. Kind of a similar thing here where we have this really extensive guarding of Peter and the fact that Peter is able to escape, pull the Houdini Act under such a uh, lock and key is evidence that, well, that it was a miraculous delivery, that, that Peter really didn't escape, but that rather God delivered him. Um, um, and then, so Peter, you know, the, the, the facts of the narrative of the story are pretty straightforward, and even the very youngest kids, you can kind of walk them through the prison break here, how the angel busts Peter out of prison. Then you get this wonderful scene here of... Peter going to the house of a woman naturally named Mary, because it seems like every woman in the New Testament is named Mary, all named after Miriam, the sister of Moses. This Mary is, you know, we talk about our small Lutheran world sometime. Um, first century <laughs> Christian church is a small world. This Mary is the mother of Mark, who you may know as the author of a book in the Bible called Mark. Uh, she would also then likely be the aunt of, or the, the sister, sorry, of Barnabas, the friend of Paul, who, well, we'll, we'll get into all of that stuff right now today. But uh, it's it's a close-knit community is kind of the takeaway here. These folks are, are sharing life together. They're sharing joys and celebrations. They're also worried. They're gathering together. They're praying for Peter. They're worried about what's going to happen. And then Peter knocks on their door, and they just leave him standing there. <laughs> that poor servant girl, nobody is believing her. She's, really, Peter, we got to let him in. Like, yeah, right, you're imagining things. And then they even go so far as to think maybe this is an angel, <laughs> but it can't actually be Peter himself. So um, there's some real good humor and irony in the story. Uh, backtracking a little bit, even the fact that Peter didn't really know what was going on until he was standing there. He literally thought he was dreaming until he looked around and realized, oh, I guess I really am out of prison. <laughs> there, there. Don't let anyone ever tell you. A, a couple things. Don't let anyone tell you that uh, following Jesus is boring because we see it's anything but boring. It's, it's not always pleasant, but it's never boring. At least it shouldn't be if we're doing our job. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the adventure here, just the sense of uncertainty, like you don't know what's going to happen uh, from one moment to the next. And then, I mean, to some extent, that's always descriptive of life. One of the takeaways I have of this story is how quickly things can change. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've seen this so many times in our life, you know, um, uh, I think everyone I'm talking to has been alive for, you know, the last couple decades at least, um, you know, you're just 2001 fall morning, Tuesday morning, everything's normal, you wake up, everything's normal, and then a couple of airplanes hit a couple of buildings, and then the, the, uh, the course for our country over the next few years is irrevocably altered and we end up enmeshed in these wars in the Middle East and and uh, yeah who knows kind of the implications all all the things that just changed in a moment that day on a Tuesday and then well more recently a few years ago just all of a sudden people start getting sick in China and then a few weeks later the world is literally shut down and 
in many respects, I mean, it's never been the same, and there's certain things that we uh, we have irrevocably altered as a result of, of going through a pandemic. And just the sheer suddenness of a lot of these things. I mean, if you go back previous generations, Pearl Harbor, you know, whatever, you, you, you have these seismic, earth-shattering things, which I guess often we think of the negative ones, but they don't always have to be negative. And in Scripture, what we see is... You know what this story really has is something that um, fiction writers are told to never have, which is uh, deus ex machina, a Greek word for God from a machine. The idea is that you, if you have characters, you know, if you're writing a story, you have characters, you need to have conflict. You need to have your characters get in trouble. As much as you love char the characters, as much as you want people to love the characters, if the characters have an easy life, you have a boring story. So you need to have your characters have adversity. And sometimes, you know, the greater adversity, the more it draws you into the story. So we're just talking purely fiction at, the, at, at this point. So you want a narrative where people have trouble, but then you got to, I mean, generally, unless you're writing a tragedy, if you're trying to have, um, you know, the feel-good movie of the summer, you want your characters to survive and actually overcome their obstacles. So some writers really write themselves into a corner. They make it so their characters are in such trouble that the only way they can get their characters out of trouble is by some miraculous intervention. And that's generally considered poor form in, in storytelling, that you, you want to have some reason that the characters are able to triumph. Um, God actually, well, God from a machine, like for Peter here, this is a deus ex machina. Uh, there's there is one antecedent to the I guess well maybe not maybe um no as I I maybe I'm arguing myself out of this there is actually one antecedent for Peter's delivery here and that is prayer <laughs> which I suppose would not be a satisfactory thing to a lot of narrative writers here uh, we're gonna have um, this character miraculously saved by angels how are we gonna set that up well we'll have a bunch of people praying for him <laughs> and uh, and then the the irony is after he's delivered, like, wait, God actually listened to that prayer? God actually, like, we, we were asking for help here for Peter, and wow, but we didn't actually expect God to do it. <laughs> so it is, a, it is a deus ex machina, and the, the takeaway for us, you know, we can't uh, always assume a deus ex machina, John the Baptist did die in prison. John the Baptist was beheaded in, after a, a, a prison sentence. But, on the same side, don't be surprised if the deus ex machina happens in the way that, uh, that we would want in our wildest dreams. Now, for Peter here, it isn't just about, well, I'm going to give Peter an opportunity to get out of prison because I like Peter. You know, God liked James, too. You know, Jesus was close to James and Peter. But there is a, a divine purpose to this. So if one is spared from prison or for some other adversity, the obvious um, implication is that God has, has a need for you. Well, not a need. God has a use for you. God has a purpose for you. God doesn't need anybody. But God does have a purpose, and he had a purpose for Peter. Many years later, Peter would be martyred. Peter would die. Uh, he would suffer. Uh, but today is not that day, as Peter is, is busted out of prison. Okay, good for Peter. But what about us? Well, uh, as I said, one implication here is that, uh, you know, that God very, very possibly will will provide miracles for his uh, his people in their time of great need because that's that's what God does. He he does love and take take delight in helping and loving his people. So um what does the story tell us about who God is and who's in his tender mercies? Just that that God is willing to save and that God gives people purposes and and uh, we shouldn't be surprised if he shows us grace. What does the story tell us about who we are as God's people? So what did Peter do to escape his prison? He was completely passive. You know, he didn't do anything. He was given the, the, the notice by the angel, get up, get ready, and let's get going. And the next thing you know, he finds himself free. 
he goes to his community. Um, you know, that we are by grace the same way. Like we were slaves to sin, we were imprisoned by sin. And uh, whether our jailer is uh, King Herod or the devil himself, uh, you know, we are powerless. We're, we're under lock and key with this maximum security setup. But God sends not not only an angel, but God sends his very son to uh, allow us to escape. When Jesus gave his first sermon back in his hometown in Luke chapter 4, he said, I have come to set the captives free. And he's talking about Peter in Acts 12. He's also talking about us today. We are the captives. We have been set free through no effort of our own. This is all the doing of Christ. And it's almost as if we're dreaming. Yeah, we, we wake up one day, we look around, boy, things have changed. Things can change in a hurry. Be ready for sudden changes. Be ready for the adventure. And and don't be surprised when these things happen. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, the, his disciples had a hard time. Like when the women came and said, he's from, he's risen, they said, you're crazy. And when Rhoda announces, like Peter's at the door, they say, you're crazy. Let's let's not uh, be so quick to discount good news. And I always go back to Genesis when Jacob is told, your son Joseph is still alive and he's ruling Egypt. Jacob's numb. He says, get out of here. I don't want to listen to this. I don't believe you. Sometimes good news can be so unbelievable. But let's always be ready to receive the good news. Let's believe it. Jesus really is risen from the dead. And Peter really did escape from prison. So... What does this tell us about who we are as God's people? We have been set free. We've been broken out of jail. And by the grace of Christ now, we have, are free to look around and say, okay, i got work to do. I don't need to be afraid of King Herod or anybody else. And uh, the implications, what does this mean for our life today? Well, I guess back to take that last point first, we have a purpose here. Peter was set free from prison for a purpose. It's, you read the rest of Acts, that, that purpose starts to un, unspool a little bit. And we don't necessarily know day to day how, how things are going to play out, what that big picture purpose is, but we can be guaranteed if we are here, we have some kind of purpose. We have been set free not to just indulge in <laughs> the joys of this world. We have been set free from our prison so that we may be of of use to God and the kingdom that he is establishing that is breaking into this world even now. Uh, the other kind of implication here is to expect the unexpected, to use a cliche. You know, be ready for anything. Be ready at a moment's notice. Be ready for a status quo change to hit us upside the head. Things can change in a hurry, and uh, things can change in our lives in a hurry, for, for bad, certainly, or for good. So be ready for those late-night phone calls, those late-night knocks on the door, those late-night visits from an angel saying, pack your bags, we got somewhere to go. You never know. Things can change overnight. Um, and then I guess the other implication here is the importance of community, although Peter is unable at this point to stick around in Jerusalem at the house of John Mark, but to realize that he's not alone. You know, Even when he was in prison, he wasn't alone. The angels were watching over him. His people were gathering and praying for him. So let's be as that community. Let's be praying for our brothers and sisters, especially our persecuted brothers and sisters, um, especially those in our congregation who are bearing burdens of any kind. Let's be people of prayer, praying for them. And um, and, and let's also recognize the, the strength that comes from community. When we find ourselves set free from prison, first place to go. Where's our sanctuary? You know, where are the other Christians? Where are our brothers and sisters in Christ? Uh, this is uh, this is the calling we have now that we've been set free from prison. All right, well, lots, lots going on. A, a simple story, but uh, a lot of neat implications as we continue these, these wonderful stories in the book of Acts. May God bless your Sunday school classes this weekend.